Hello everybody and I'm delighted to once again welcome you all to the latest installment of the Castle Bookshop podcast. Uh, once again, thank you very much for all your feedback. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, I suppose just to know that there's other people on the other side of the computer and that I'm not here talking away to myself. Um, for this installment, I'm delighted to welcome um, the author Patricia Byrne. Uh, we've known Patricia for quite some time in, in the bookshop, although we've never met. Um, we're very familiar with her books, and I suppose in our game, when one reads an author's books, one feels that one knows that author. So uh, it's delighted to meet you. I'm delighted to meet you in person, Patricia, and I'm delighted to welcome you to to the Castle Bookshop podcast. Thanks, David. Lovely. And uh, such a fine mail shop um, over the years. So really, really nice to meet you and to talk about my books, particularly my Apple books. Yes, thank you, Patricia. So I guess what prompted me to, 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 to invite you on, on board uh, for, for today is your latest collaboration with Red Fox Press, which is called Ackle Colony. Now, uh, it's a beautiful book uh, as and, you know, compliments to all in Red Fox Press. Um, they produce wonderful books. Um, and I guess what makes this book so attractive to me personally is that it really does couple a kind of a, a pictorial history of the Ackle colony and it, it gives the reader a real feel in, in terms of visually um, the sites and the relevant parts of Ackle that, that would have pertained to the Ackle colony. And also there's actually quite a bit of history in it. It's a small enough book, but there's actually quite a lot of information in it. Uh, and I think that's a, a wonderful combination. So I figure uh, let's let's start with a general overview of the Ackle colony. What was it? Um, and yeah. I suppose why is it so controversial to this okay. day? Well, yes, it is. And it's wonderful to partner with Ham in Red Fox Press. And those of you who have ever driven that road along North Ackle in Dugart um, will, have, will have come across uh, Ham, um, Red Fox Press. And it sort of was a joint project. Ham is a wonderful illustrator and artist. And her visuals combined with my text, I'm Absolutely delighted with it. Um, I, I couldn't have done that book unless I'd actually done uh, this book, which is the story of the Apple Mission Colony. And it took me about five years uh, to research it and to write it. Um, and even though it's factually um, um, well documented, it's written in, a, in an easy style, I suppose, almost like a novel. Um, and it, it's an extraordinary story. It kind of spans the 19th century from the 18th when Edward Mendel and his wife Eliza and three little girls landed on the strand at Dugurt, that beautiful strand at Dugurt, um, and the, the housing was already being built uh, because he'd had he'd come a few years earlier. So from 1830, it spanned right through into the 1880s, uh, and it was an extraordinary story because there was conflict, there was religious conflict with. Uh, John McHale, the fiery Archbishop of Tume. There was obviously the famine con um, uh, conflict and charges of superism against Edward Nangle because during the famine he began he offered uh, food to children in the schools, but of course they were evangelizing schools. Uh, so people claimed he was using food to attract converts to his mission. And then later on, after the famine. Um, you had another phase of the Ackle Mission Colony where it became the biggest land, landlord in Ackle. So you had education, you had religion, you had famine, you had land, you had all those ingredients of the 19th century. And all of them together really made a very powerful, powerful story. So that's really what I, I tried to capture in that book. Um, anyone who visits Ackle, I'm really, uh, I really encourage people to go to all these places uh, because if you go to many, you will know St. Thomas Church in Dugart that you pass on that road. And just across from St. Thomas Church, sometimes you can miss it because it's in among shrubbery, is the remains of what was a little town, really, uh, built on the slopes of Schlieve Moor. Extraordinary in, in the 1830s because there were pro probably no slated houses on the island. There were only cabins. So it was an extraordinary visual sight to see this small town being built on the slopes of Schlieve Moor uh, in L shape. Um, and most of, the, most of those houses are still there. And then across the road is St. Thomas's Church, which you can visit. 
and which Edward Nangle uh, built in the 1850s, actually after the famine when that was built. And again, if you go into that, there are a number of plaques and visuals that actually catch that history through 19th century Apple. So I spent, uh, spent about five years working on the research for that book, particularly going through the Mission Colony, uh, the Ackle Missionary Herald, which was a newspaper that uh, Edward Nangle published from 1837 for about for almost 40 years. Um, so he published that. It was a play. Uh, he brought uh, a printing press to Dugart, extraordinary that the printing press. And it's really interesting to me that almost 200 years later, Red Fox Press are doing the whole thing. <laughs> in the same way. <laughs> Yeah, in the same way. Extraordinary story, and almost a microcosm of, of Irish history during that period, during that very turbulent uh, 19th century period. Yeah, and like you, you've touched on it there, Patricia. Um, I suppose, like him or loathe them, all Edward Nagel achieved. He built a town, churches. Um, he was, a, you know, as I said, like him or loathe them, he was very, he was obviously a very industrious and talented man and very determined man. Yeah, um, I, su I suppose. Can I? Can I? I've always wondered um, because I, I was aware of the huge amount of research uh, that was involved in your book um, and that it went on for five years. I always wondered. Uh, I suppose you. But what I'm getting at is by doing that amount of research, I would, I would, I would feel that you get a sense of the man and a sense of yeah, a sense of him, really, a sense of his character. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think of him? Well, I, I he, the complex. Um, his mother died when he was very young. Like actually, like John McHale, there were lots of similarities, and he he was quite volatile. He was quite unstable at, at times mentally. Had a breakdown while he was in Cavan in the eighteen twenties, and then met Dr. Neeson Adams, who was almost like a father figure to him. Got married. Um, so quite volatile, almost, uh, sometimes I say he had almost some of the characteristics of a bipolar disorder, you know, huge energy, uh, but at the same time he could collapse, his health could collapse, and very single-minded, um, very um, anti what he called popery, Catholicism, felt Catholicism was at the root of all of Ireland's ills, so that, that drove him very much. But in addition to that, he was also very entrepreneurial, like he had a great um, driving force in terms of land development, building development. Um, so almost huge, huge skills in raising money. So he, each year he went abroad to England and across Ireland, and he used the Mackin Missionary Herald. And he, he raised extraordinary amounts of money, particularly during the famine. So great fundraising ability, and again, when he acquired the land, a great ability to, you know, um, be a landlord, I suppose. On the downside, I think um, one of the things I learned is that his family, his wife, Eliza, um, who suffered from poor health from once she arrived in Ackle, he, she gave birth to 10 children, six of them predeceased her. And she and those six children are buried in Schlieve Moor. So she suffered terribly. And she suffered as well because he was absent for long periods. So he was single-minded, but I think to the detriment uh, of his family. And the other thing really I concluded was that even though in his mission, he wanted to bring the Bible uh, to the people of Akkal in their native language through Irish, and the Bible was translated and so on. So even though he did that, I really felt myself he had little time for the, the, the folk culture of the people or their own practices. He really, he really looked down on all that, uh, that side of the people and probably little empathy. Whereas Dr. Neeson Adams, who came to Ackle with him, uh, seemed to have a lot more empathy in terms of the famine and giving the people services and so on. But Edward Nangle seemed to seem to lack that and a real empathy with the people. So a very complex character with, as you say, extraordinary gifts, really extraordinary yeah. gifts, but with a lot of a uh, lot of downsides as well. I, I wonder, Patricia, like I, I suppose it's fair to say the Ackle was set up to convert. Uh, the local population. 
And, you know, uh, you alluded to it there, the accusations of superism, so using food to kind of convert the, the, the families at the time, um, which I suppose if you were being pragmatic about it or realistic, you couldn't blame the locals for doing that. You know, I, I think anyone in, the, in, their, in their shoes would do that. But I suppose if, you, if we went back a step, why, why Ackle? Why, did it, why do you think he came to Ackle? Well, he, he on this notion, he was based in Cavan in the 1820s. And in Cavan in the 1820s, there was a whole thing that we call the Second Reformation, which was a whole evangelization movement across Ulster. And Lord Farnham in Cavan, in particularly, he was uh, very much, it was kind of a two-pronged approach, convert the tenants from popery and Catholicism and help them to improve their, their land and the way they live and so on. So there was kind of two sides to Lord Farnham's approach. And um, uh, Edward Nangle was in Arva, a few miles from Cavan at the time, and he became imbued with this whole notion. So it was a combination of convert them from popery, from, um, uh, uh, to, the, to the Protestants' faith, but also get them to improve the way they farm their land, the way they live their lives and so on. So it was both, both of these things. But by the time the, the, the famine struck in 1845, 1846, I mean, he was very controversial even before the famine because he had what he called public recantation ceremonies in Dugart. So people who joined the colony, they had public services whereby they gave up their Catholic faith and joined the Protestant faith. So a lot of that, he had a priest asylum. So a lot of that was controversial even before the famine hit. Then when the famine hit, the very first thing he did was to offer food to the children in the schools. And of course, that immediately created a demand from people all over Ackle to have similar schools in their areas. But of course, the, the, the contentious point was that these schools were what he called scriptural schools. So they were schools which also uh, sought to convert the children. So that became the contentious point. But um, uh, Asenet Nicholson, uh, who's an American, and when she visited Ackle, she interviewed the children and uh, they had quite a lighthearted approach to it. And they said, yeah, we go to these schools and we get our, our food, but when the potatoes come back in again, we'll just leave. So there was quite a, a lighthearted approach. But at the same time, it was very divisive. The folklore of Akel would show you that it created really great division within Akel between those, um, you know, and those that didn't. And that's really, I think that hurt and that divisiveness has continued down through the generations, um, um, even though it was quite successful at the time in terms of converts. No, I, I often thought that, and I guess, um, I suppose the more books on Irish history or history in general that one reads, you see that history repeats itself. If you look at the divisiveness that that would have caused, so some families availing of the schools and some yeah. not, or some of some, I suppose, fundamentally starving themselves to a certain extent. Um, and I, I am aware that there's that element of, uh, is it fair to say it still lingers, that kind of divisiveness or that, I mean, divisiveness might be too strong a word, but that the... the that the Ackle colony still lives on, for want of a better expression, on the island, that there's still that sense that... Yeah, I think, I think when I started to search this book, I, I felt it was almost as if there was a hidden hurt still there. Now, that hurt, I feel, isn't as simple. Part of it is called superism, but it's a hurt, it's a combination of, of that plus the devastation of the family, of the famine, but also the fact that uh, the Ackle Mission then became a landlord after the famine, and that almost made it more a deep-seated hurt, because then it was combined to land as well, and the Ackle Mission had control over a lot of the land in Ackle, and the suggestion and the complaints were that people who got leases and so on were people who were favourable to the Ackle colony or were part of the Ackle so it was a combination of things, I think, in a complex, in a complex um, sort of history, history, really. Yeah. yeah, a complex mix of all those different factors, I suppose. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I suppose, yeah, it must have been a very difficult, a difficult time. Like if you think about a, a famine and then this sort of religious pressure and then 
you come out of the famine and you're into having a landlord that may may have favoured or may not have favoured his his flock for once with want of a better yeah. expression. It kind now the of... issue post famine year in fifties, um, Edward Nangle himself had had been had moved to uh, County Sligo as a rector in Screen, but he still was the was the head of the Apple Mission. And it was an extraordinary development because once the Apple Mission became the landlord, they began to invite in people. So a lot of um, external people arrived in Apple. So you had people like William Pike, who became a notorious landlord around the evictions at Alt. You had Captain Boycott, who came subleased land from the Apple Mission. Um, you had Hector, the Scottish guy, who came and set up um, a fishery. So you had this in extraordinary influx of people at the same time as you had a lot of clearances and a lot of immigration. Um, so that was a really, um, um, like I found that the 1850s were really, it was all around land ag ag agitation and bitterness about land and so on. And then by the 1860s, really the colony was beginning to decline and you had the Land Acts and you had the Irish Church Act. So by the 1870s, 1880s was beginning to decline. Um, and there was a lot of internal division within the Act Commission because some people felt it had become a landlord lo rather than looking after its missionary activity or the welfare of the okay. island. It nearly became a victim of its own success, so in that regard, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Edward Nangle himself died. He remarried after his wife died. Eliza died in 1850. And she's buried, as I said, up on the slopes, just behind the settlement with her children. But he remarried and he's buried in Dublin, in Deedsgrange Cemetery with his second wife. Um, okay. But even after he died, uh, even within the Protestant community, there were kind of different views of him, like people who felt, you know, he was he had the right approach in terms of attacking Pope Ray. Yeah, of course, yeah. And, and people who felt, he was really too aggressive, didn't have enough, enough empathy and so on. So that was even within his own community. There were different views. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose a, a, a controversial figure to this day. And, and, and uh, yeah, I suppose he lives on. Um, yeah. I, just, I, I just wanted to, if I can, share a couple of pages from your new book with, with Red Fox, because it really is beautiful. It's such a visual book. Um, and as you said, it was. I suppose it's it's done in such a traditional way. I, I had kind of forgotten about the the um, newspaper that Edward Angle had and the way it was done. And now, yeah, it's, it's actually a lovely connection. That the, so for for our listeners, Red Fox, they, all their books are hand handmade, so they're hand sewn by by Ham and her husband Fra or uh, business partner Francis. Um, yes. So yeah, they're they're a wonderful. It's, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a they're a wonderful thing to have. I don't know. You have this sense of kind of that they're artisan and, you know. So mm. this is just, if I could sh share this picture, it might be great on the screen. So I suppose I'm encouraging people to buy the book to see it, if I'm, if I'm honest. But it's just a beautiful picture here um, of Keem, which is, I suppose yeah. everybody knows Keem. And then there's just a lovely accompanying letter. Um, I don't know if you remember this one, Patricia, um, from the Ackle Herald in April 1851. And this, was, this is what makes this book really attractive to me. These lovely visual images and then they're really um, linked in with, um, I suppose, wonderful accompanying text. It really does make the book. I'm not, I know, I know you're involved in it. I don't want to be kind of over complimentary, but I, I can't be. It's, 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 it's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. I, what, what I really like in the book, because obviously my full book is, um, and the Academician Herald, there's volumes and volumes of text. Yeah. So um, for somebody through this little art book, for somebody who just wants to capture the essence of the story, I just tried to reproduce some text from the time, really, as well as my, mm -hmm. own, my own reflections on it. And what, what I say to people who are going to Ackle, and I think this year with all the staycationers and so on, hopefully a lot of people mm -hmm. will come to Ackle. And I think people think of the beautiful scenery and the drives and the wild Atlantic way and so on, and, the, and so on. And there's all of that side, side to it. But I suppose what I try to do is to encourage people to look a bit more deeply at the heritage side, and particularly the active colony, but other heritage as well. So some of the scenes in my book, for instance, I've said to people, when you get to Ackle, why not start with um, the Ackle experience? You know where the aquarium is just outside Kiel? They actually 
have a, um, they have a heritage exhibition. Uh, they have an exhibition area as part of that, which is a wonderful introduction to the overall history of Ackle. You, you do it in about an hour. So I encourage people to start with that and then drive or, or walk or cycle up to the deserted village. Now, deserted village is on the slopes of Schlieve Moor. It was where, it was near that, that Edward Nangle set up his first school in the 1830s. So if you go to the deserted village on the slopes of Schlieve Moor, there are about 80 houses, derelict cottages that stretch right across the mountain towards the Atlantic. And that gives you a wonderful feel of the famine and the clearances and so on, you can still see the lazy beds there. Then you can continue from the deserted village over to the colony itself, St. Thomas's Church, which is usually open. It's uh, the community, the Protestant community keep that open all year round. You can go into St. Thomas's Church and you can see all the plaques to Edward Nangel and all the people associated with the colony. It's a beautiful, a beautiful uh, church. Then you can go across the road and actually walk the um, the street, the main street, which was the actual uh, colony itself. I don't know if you can see it there, but that's the main, oh, it's, it's, it's a little bit run down at the moment, but you can actually see the main street. Uh, Gray's guest house used to be there, but it's now closed. Um, and that was, uh, that was part of the colony. Um, and then you can go to the, the, the graveyards and so on, so on behind it. Uh, you, you can you can also go to Ken because in Ken you'll see Captain Boycott's house and he had sublet, sublet that land uh, in the 1850s uh, from the Apple Mission. And if you really feel motivated, you can go across the island to Muilin, which is on the west of the island. Now, there isn't a lot of Muilin, but these are the old buildings because during the 1840s, Edward Nangle decided to expand what was in Dugart and do a mini, mini colony in, in Muilin. And most of it is, uh, you've only um, um, broken down buildings at this stage. And it's amazing to me that all the building work at Muilin went on through the famine years because he was going abroad. He was collecting between five and 7,000 pounds annually, which was really, in today's money, it's it's really, money, really yeah. a lot of money. And he was spending this money, he was spending it on the school food program because they were uh, feeding up to between 1,000 and 2,000 children during the famine. But he was also spending a lot of the money on, on infrastructure, on drainage, on land reclamation, on putting up more buildings, and also on developing Muilin. And actually, in Muilin, he ended up putting a training school. It was almost like a seminary to change to train his scripture readers and, and so on. So really you can do a wonderful, uh, we might talk about Valley Moment and, and Bunkari Monastery. Um, I, I mentioned, I go from Ackle Sound to Kiel, which is the main road most people would take. When you come to Cashel, again, it's in among trees, there's the remains of what was Bunkari Monastery because happened in 1850 is John McHale was so antagonized at what the Apple mission, the way they had expanded and what they'd done during the famine, he decided to fight, fight back. So he bought a, a very large site at Bunakuri, at Bunakuri um, and he invited the monks, uh, the Franciscan monks to come to Bunakuri. And they set up almost their own little colony. So they had a school, they had a church, they had land reclamation. So it was almost at his own, at, at his own game. Um, and he set up that. And that's another place. Actually, at the moment, that's been developed into a heritage site. Um, so I think you'll probably be able to gain access now. Oh, that's, that's, that's just for, for those. I mean, I know that uh, Archbishop McKay was the, the Bishop of, of Tume, so he would have been... For, to put it crudely, on the Catholic side, so that's what I suppose you had a battle of the religions there for for well for a while, I suppose. It, it was it was unusual. It, well, it was a coincidence that John McHale became Archbishop of Tuam in eighteen thirty four, which was the year that Edward Nangle and his family arrived in Ackle. So they really locked horns. Yeah. Them. And uh, John McHale used to do very provocative um, visits to Ackle and. Uh, go with his priests by the colony and preach in outdoor sermons at Duke Canella Beach. So it was all very, 
uh, provocative stuff between the two of them. There were two times. Sure. I'm sure, yeah, and I'm sure, uh, that's what I was about to say. I'm sure one egged the other on to a certain extent as well, notwithstanding the fact that we you know they were trying to promote their respective religions. Yeah. There was no doubt a little bit of one upmanship when you read, yeah. you know, you read what one was doing, and sure, it was to only get at the other guy, you know, really. Yeah, and both were very talented with words, like they were great preachers, they were great writers. And they really had enormous talent, the two of them. And it was just that the two of them were on the stage at the same time was really, yeah. really something else. Yeah. Yeah. Two heavyweights duking it out, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So as, as you discussed, Patricia, like um, a lot of the groundwork for your for your latest book on Ackle Connolly, uh, or sorry, on the Ackle Colony was uh, done with, with your book, The Preacher and the Prelate, um, which is, you know, a very, I suppose, it would be fair to say, you know, that the account, the, the the comprehensive account of all that went on at that time. Um, so, dare I say, it, they're they're a nice little couple, the two books. Yeah. But you, you also, I, I think this was your first book on Ackle, uh, the yeah. Veil, the Veil Woman of Ackle. It's certainly the first one I re I recall. Actually, it's almost a decade since I started working, and this was actually what attracted me to Ackle, David. We've mentioned Bunnankuri Monastery and I, before my father died, I realised that I actually had a relation uh, who was based in Ackle and was actually based at Bunnankuri Monastery in the late 1800s. I hadn't realised that. And, and I, I was actually a writer. He used to keep diaries and he had kept this diary and he was, he befriended, even though he was a Franciscan monk, he befriended a guy called James Lynch Hahn. And James Lynch Hahn obviously is, is, is features in this book because James Lynch Hahn was a notorious, quite a notorious guy in Ackle in, after the Ackle mission period now in the 1890s. And in 1894, it was a very turbulent time in Ackle because people who know a bit about Ackle history will, will know that in June 1894, you had that awful tragedy where over 30 people died in Clude Bay they were tatty hawkers on mainly younger, a lot of them young girls on the way to Scotland, the, the harvest fields. Uh, so it was a very volatile time. Michael Davitt was around with land agitation. And this character, James Lynch Hahn, the Valley House is up in North Ackle as well, not far from the colony. It's now a, it's, it's now a hostel owned by the Gallagher family. Many people, great place for music sessions and so on, has a fairy trail at, at the moment. So that house um, and that estate was owned by an English woman, Agnes MacDonald, who had taken it over. Um, and she had given employment to this guy, James Lynch and Hawn, who was from Koran. But he was volatile and they fell out. And in October 1894, one night, he attacked her. He attacked her. He set the Valley House on light, a light. She was uh, badly injured. Um, that's her, that's uh, uh, her there, and that's in Jahan, the fire in the background. She was very badly injured, and that's why we called the veiled woman because she, had, she covered her face with the veil. So it became very notorious. He was arrested, he was convicted, James Lynn Jahan, but he, he kept escaping custody. He was on the run and he'd be found. So this extraordinary folklore grew up around him. And my relation actually seemed to befriend him and actually wrote a lot about him in his handwritten manuscripts. Um, he eventually uh, escaped to the United States and the authorities tried to get him back, but he claimed his crime was a political one, extraordinary, and he resisted extradition in a very famous court case. Um, so he evaded, uh, he evaded uh, captivity for a long time. Eventually he, he, he came back. The other aspect to this story is that when John Millington Singh visited, not Ackle, but he visited Mayo and um, Bell Mullet and all those areas in uh, 1904, while he was writing the Playboy of the Western World. Um, and he talks about Lincoln and another um, from uh, Connemara as being an influence, this kind of Playboy kind of figure that people looked up to, but was had a very bad side to him, but became a, such a folklore figure. So uh, James Lynch Hahn was one of the influences on, um, uh, on, on Millington Singh in writing the Playboy of the Western World. And there was also a film written, done about it, Love and Rage. I don't know if any of you remember the film with Daniel Craig and Greta uh, Scacchi. 
Um, so well, I didn't know about that. Yeah. My first book, and then I got into the colony after that. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I, yeah, I suppose I, I think that draws our, our, our conversation to a natural, a natural conclusion, Patricia. Uh, I think everyone can see the the passion you have and the interest you have in Ackill. Um, certainly, Mayo County Council or the Ackill Tourism Board could could give you a twist now for for that suggested route. But there is like outside of the history, there's no better place. The weather in Ireland at the moment is beautiful. The weather in Mayo is beautiful. So. And you, you can't really beat Ackle on a, on, a, on a nice weekend. There's some amazing places, and I guess yeah. it will be no harm to 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 uh, pick, pick up a little bit of history, or you know, I suppose even to be aware of, of what's going on when you're when you're just taking in the beautiful sights. Uh, so, listen, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Uh, your three Ackle books, as you correctly correctly corrected me, um, the Ackle Colony, the Veiled Woman of Ackle, and the Preacher and the Prelate. Um, they're all available in the Castle Bookshop in Castle Bar and also online on mayobooks.ie. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Thank you very much, David. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.